really glad that since Sarah's been here that she's picked up a few things from me and the piano playing. I mean, this, I've, I've taught her. It's been a lot of hard work, but she's, she's really come along this time. I don't know the first thing about playing piano, so that's an absolute lie. Hey, fun fact. Did you guys know that Cookie Monster's real name is Sid? I bet most of you didn't know that. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I was telling Brian before the uh, service today, I said, here's the deal. I impart spiritual knowledge, but I also like to impart useless Jeopardy knowledge as well, too. So if you find yourself on a trivia show someday, and that is the last question, you can't say that you didn't hear it from me. I tried to give it to you. I tried to warn you. In uh, Jim Collins, the famous business writer, his 1994 book, built to last, he coined a term in that book that has since become legendary. It's become well-known, particularly in the business world, but it has leaked into other parts uh, of society as well, too. And one of the main features and one of the main emphases of Collins' book, Built to Last, is that any corporation, any business, any company that wants to experience success and really take a giant leap in their growth, needs to have what he termed in his book, BHAGs. And you're like, BHAGs? I don't know, that sounds really weird. Not be a hag, but BHAGs, all right? And BHAGs was his shorthand way of referring, referring to what he called big, hairy, audacious goals. A BHAG. In his thinking, BHAGs are the 10... 15, 20-year vision and goals that a company uses to create and to sustain momentum. If a company doesn't have big, hairy, audacious goals, they're not going anywhere. They're just staying stuck. That's what his premise was. And as such, these goals have to be so audacious, they have to be so big that seeing them to completion is, is so daunting, it's so perilous, that it would be sort of like he likened it to climbing Mount Everest. If you and I were to go out and try to climb Mount Everest, if we sit here today and I said to Adam, I said, Adam, here's the deal, 2023, you, I, Brian, we're going Mount Everest on this thing. That's a pretty big, hairy, audacious goal because probably the biggest mountain I've ever climbed would be like 5,000 feet, all right? So it's, it's, we're, we're going way above that. Something that when, a a, a BHAG, guys, is something that when somebody hears it and you say, like, this is what we want to do, this is what I want to do, they just gasp because it's that impossible, it's that unlikely, it's that crazy. I've uh, brought here this morning some classic BHAG examples of some very well-known companies. I want you to see if you can guess what these companies are, the first one up here, the, their BHAG is to become the most recognized and respected consumer brand in the world. Can you imagine who that might be? Any guesses? Say it out loud. Walmart, all right, is a guess. Anybody else? Do, do what? Amazon is another great guess. You're wrong. It's actually Starbucks. That was their BHAG. We want to be the most respected and well-known brand in the world. How about this one? Every book ever printed in any language, all available in less than 60 seconds. Amazon, you guys got that one right? Amazon is that, that's their BHAG. How about this one? A computer on every desk in every home. Apple? Microsoft, yes. Is is somebody on Google right now, like Googling, and they're like, boom, gotcha. No, Microsoft, that is their BHAG. About this one, to become the Harvard of the West. Stanford University, that is their BHAG. It's a pretty big statement. It's a pretty big thing that they want to do. And the last one is this. Everybody should probably get this one, right? To land a man on the moon and to return him safely to Earth. NASA, it was the Apollo, what mission? 11 mission in 1969 to land a man on the moon and to return him safely to Earth. These are obviously, as I read these and you hear these, these are lofty goals to shoot for. But that's the point, guys. They they drive a company, they drive an organization, they drive a business towards what seems impossible to achieve 
their unthinkable success. But here's what's true for us this morning as we sit here, as I stand here. For the believer and for the follower of Christ, BHAGs, guys, are not our responsibility. Now, there's nothing wrong in life, especially for a believer to plan and to prepare and to choose the path on which you're going to take. But guys, BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals and missions are God's territory. He has already set the course. We just choose if we're going to walk it. And in that regard, guys, what I want to talk about this morning is not audacious goals, but I want to talk what I think really propels and what really stain, sustains BHAGs, and that's my acronym that I've made up, but really not me. I've just kind of put it together this week, a BHAF, all right? We don't have BHAGs. God has those, but we need to have big, hairy, audacious, what would you guess the F is for? That word that we use a lot, like I have faith that this is going to happen. I need to have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. I need a big faith. This is what we're going to center on this morning and this concept of how in the world do we gain, if we're going to experience the power of God, gain a audacious, big, bold faith. I want you to think of it this way, and I want you to like put this and stamp this question on your mind and on your heart. All right, This isn't just a rhetorical like, oh, he's just throwing a question out there. I really want you to think about this. If God answered every one of your prayers that you've been praying for the last few days, for the last few weeks, for the last few months, or last few years, if God honored every one of your steps of faith, what would really change in the world? What would be different about the world? What would be different about God's kingdom? What would be different about your life if God says, I'm going to give you everything that you've asked for? Personally, myself, I think this way, and I think that most of us would agree with this, sometimes, many times, our prayers are far too small, aren't they? Like God says, I'll, I'll give you that, but it's really not going to change a whole lot in the grand scheme of everything. It's because we don't have a big, bold faith that we don't ask, and that we don't receive, and nothing really changes in life. And again, we've been talking, we started last week, we continue this week, and we'll for the next two weeks. Why in the world do I not have God's power in my life? And I'm not going to say it this way today, well, if you, if you believe enough, you believe hard enough, then you'll get this. And likewise, on the other hand, if you are not receiving what you're asking for, it's because you don't have enough. That's, that's irresponsible. But there is something, I think, between that that we can find, and it happens in the life of Elijah. It happens in the life of Elisha. We're going to see that in our text this morning. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Kings chapter 2. That's where we'll park ourselves this morning. I misspoke a little bit last week and looking ahead and kind of trying to chart where we're going to go. I said we're going to spend two complete weeks on Elijah and then two complete weeks on Elisha. Well, poor Elijah is going to get shafted in this sermon series, all right? He's here this morning, but as we're going to see, he's going to be gone pretty quick, all right? And then everything from here on out is going to center on Elisha, which I think is okay because I think that we really know Elijah. And Elijah, we talked about last week, was fed by ravens. He's by a brook. He goes to get fed by a widow. It gets crazier and crazier. He, he resurrects a young boy, this widow's son, the first resurrection we have documented in the Bible. We won't even talk about, we don't even get to talk about 1 Kings 18 where he stands on a mountain and he faces down the prophets of Baal. This contest on Mount Carmel, we talked about that last year. You can go read in your Bibles, 1 Kings 18. We've come from that, and we come to a moment here in 2 Kings 2 where Elijah and Elisha, almost best friends it seems like, but it's really not best friends. It's more like a, a father-son relationship, a mentor-mentee relationship. And something interesting happens as a part of this relationship we're going to look here at 2 Kings 2, but we're also going to look back as well to Elisha's call into the ministry to try to chart some things about how we grab a hold of God's power and how we have a bold, audacious faith. And we're starting here, verse 1, 2 Kings 2. 
when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, and this is interesting to me because it seems as we read the story and as you catch this, Elisha already knows that Elijah is going to be taken away from him. Not only him, but a group of prophets, they're called, a school of prophets, also have some insight that Elijah is no longer going to be here. I don't know how that was revealed to them, where it was revealed to them, but that evidently happens. And so he's, he's getting ready to be taken up into heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha. That's not, I try to, not to make that confusing this morning. They were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. What's that remind you of? Another story in the Old Testament that reminds you of who? Ruth and Naomi, right? Like I read this and I think of that story. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here, stuck to you by your side, Elisha says to Elijah. And so they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And again, he says, of course I know. Somewhere it's been revealed to him. But be quiet about it. In another translation, it's like shush your mouth is what Elisha is saying here. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. And so they went on together to Jericho. Then again, the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away today? Shh, I know it. You may be asking yourself, what in the world are these group of prophets? What is a school of prophets that shows up time and time again in this chapter? It was like, uh, if you think of it this way today in a modern sense, it would be like our Bible uh, schools and our seminaries is kind of what it was. Elijah had set these up, and he was just basically going around to kind of, I guess you would say, do the Elijah farewell tour. All right, guys, I'm going, but I just want to check in on you, make sure everything's okay, all right? And I'm going to leave you in good hands. So he says, stay here. In verse 6, the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River, but again, Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives, you yourself live. I will never leave you. And so they went on together. Fifty men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha, I don't think, has to think but like a split second. He knows exactly what he wants. Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. This is not Elisha asking, I want to be greater than you. I want to be twice the man that you are. That's not what he's asking. He is asking, I have seen you and I have followed you for years and I want what you have. And I want a lot of it. I want to be filled with it so I can experience the power that I, of God that I see in you, Elijah. Elijah says, you have asked a difficult thing. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. As they were walking along and talking, and imagine this scenario, by the way. You're walking with your friend. You're walking with your mentor. Suddenly, a chariot of fire appears. And they were drawn by horses of fire. Which, by the way, in Scripture, that always signaled like doom, war, not good things. And so you can imagine that Elisha is not like, oh, hum, look, a chariot of fire and horses that are on fire. No, he's probably freaking out. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress, in mourning, in lament that he had lost his master. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he, had, he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River, and he struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elisha? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. When the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what had happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rest upon Elisha. And they went to meet him, and they bowed down to the ground before him. And like I said last week, I told you we would talk 
about Elijah, uh, but really today what we're going to talk about is Elijah stepping off of the scene and he's about to be taken into heaven and he passes on his leadership baton, if you will, to his good friend and his spiritual son, Elisha. He is, Elisha will assume Elijah's ministry and his leadership role, but guys, not, none of that happens in this story. I think we get caught up in the story in what happens with these this chariot of fire and these horses that are on fire, we're like, ooh, ah, that's really amazing. What's all that mean? There are a lot of things here, a lot of faith-stretching moments that happen along the way in these two guys' lives. And so I want to turn our attention this morning not to chariots of fire and to horses of fire, but I want to turn our attention towards what takes place in this moment and see what we can take and apply to our own lives as it has to do with having a big, bold faith. A big, bold faith that has us believe that great things are in store. And that's what I'm going to major on this morning. And I know that you're sitting there, you're like, yeah, great things are in store. I just talked to Nancy before the service. I'm like, how did week one of school go? And she's like, it's in the books. Hey, <laughs> that's what she said. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of like knew that was coming, but greater things are in store, not just in an education sense, not just in a school sense, but for our lives, guys, as believers, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we have to believe that greater things are in store. Those who believe in the big, hairy, audacious goals of God, the mission of God. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain is famously quoted as saying one time, I believe that good things come to those who work. It sounds really good, does it, on the surface? You're like, yeah, I can get behind that. If I just work hard enough, really great things will come to me. There's only one problem, life. And most of us have probably figured out that it doesn't matter how much we work, how hard we work, how diligent we are in our work, sometimes bad stuff happens, doesn't it? Sometimes circumstances aren't what we want them to be. And so, sorry, Will, it sounds really great, but it's not what the Bible teaches because of our American ideals and our fortitude, it sounds really right, but it's not what we find as we survey the entire Bible. It doesn't, it's not what shows up in the life of Elijah and Elisha. And it's not that Elijah and Elisha weren't diligent about what they had been called to. They were, just weren't driven by working for what God had already accomplished. You see, guys, just like Elijah and Elisha, we believe that good things come to those who expect great things and have a bold faith to rely on the promises and truth of God. That's when good things come. When we look at what God has said and he said, I've got greater things in store for you. I've got better for you. I've got a life in abundance for you. If you just step into that and have a bold faith and step into that, that's when good things come. And guys, this is not some like blind pie in the sky, a wish thrown out there. We just want to all feel good and have good vibes in our life when we say that. Guys, we believe in greater things that are in store because we believe in a God who always has plenty in his storehouses. Way more than we would ever be able to believe. In fact, that's why Paul says, and he brings it up, and he talks about this concept in 1 Corinthians. This, that God has enough in the storehouses, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Try to dream your biggest dream. God will go way beyond that. That's the goodness of God. I like the way that Pastor John Piper states it and says it. Listen to this. It's so important. For those who are in Christ, it is only a matter of time until his only joy. I love, I love, love the beauty of that line. It's also echoed in Scripture as well, too, in Proverbs 4.18, probably something that you would never know it was there, but it's hidden away. Proverbs 4.18 says this, The way, life of the righteous, is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. Now, guys, this is not, there is a silver lining to every cloud, and things will always work out. No, this is a big, bold faith will lead us to know 
that the light is just going to get brighter for us as we get closer to Jesus, as we get closer to eternity with God. And again, I say all that because as we step into 2 Kings 2 here, we step into a, a, a moment, and I told you last time about the state of Israel as we talked about the life of Elijah. Second Kings brings us more of the idolatrous train wreck that was Israel. Well, things are not great. Things are not rosy. It is pretty gloomy in Israel still. It's getting worse. It picks up at the kingdom spiraling downward toward exile. But the story within the story, guys, gives us two faithful believers who are determined to go no other way but God's way. That's what we see in these two men here in Elijah and Elisha. From the get-go in 2 Kings 2, we have a sense that greater things are in store. Now, it may not look like it on the surface, in the context of the kingdom, in the context of Elisha losing Elijah. But there's something very, very clear here to the flow of the story and in the life, especially of Elisha, that as we look closer, we see what's really happening. We understand how in the world we grab a hold of a big, bold faith. And first of all, what's very obvious to me as we open up the scene here and we look in 2 Kings 2, it's obvious to me that Elijah has a plan of action that he is following. It's almost like he's like living a script here. I mean, he, it says he plans to travel from Gilgal to Bethel and from Bethel to Jericho and from Jericho to the Jordan River. And if you know your Bible, and if you don't, let me just give you a, a little bit of a brief refreshing here. These are all very significant places in Scripture. These are all very significant places in the life and the history of Israel. Bethel, Jericho rings a bell probably for most all of us. Certainly the Jordan River rings a bell for most all of us. Guys, in a, in a nutshell, what this is doing here is it's retracing the first move for, movements that Israel made into the promised land. The parting of the Jordan River here in the story reminds us of the crossing of the Red Sea or even Joshua's crossing over to go into the promised land and to take Jericho. It calls attention to the similarities between Elisha's succession of Elijah and Joshua's succession of Moses. And as best as I can tell, and the quickest way that I can give you, what is the significance of all these places is that all of these places that are mentioned here in 2 Kings 2 were largely about new beginnings. They were very much about new horizons. We're, we're being taken back on a tour through all of the significant places where Israel had been all the while not missing in a story that God was wanting to take them somewhere else with someone like e Elisha, leading God's people to a, a new place that would require an expanded faith. There's something very, very interesting and very, very important about all these places too, right? Because we also do this in our life. We don't, we don't necessarily have a place we go to called Bethel or Jericho or Jordan, but we have memories. We have moments where like, oh, wasn't that a... Isn't that a good time right over there? You remember that when we were there? You remember when we did that? You remember when we celebrated that? Remember when we went through that and what God did and how he provided? All of these places that they visit are significant as well too because they are places that represent where God's people can also easily get stuck. Where they can just stay if they're not very careful. And I think that, it, I, I don't think it, I know because it's true in my life. Isn't it weird how the older you get, the more fearful you get of things? Like when I was a kid, when I was a teen, when I was a little punk, early 20-year-old going into ministry, I was like, I conquer the world. I'll do anything, I'll try anything, I'll go anywhere, I'll do it. And now I'm a 41-year-old man, and I'm like, I can't even make a simple decision because I'm afraid that it's going to fail. And it's going to fall flat on its face. Guys, those are our Bethel moments. Those are Jericho moments. Those are Jordan River moments. They're very important, but we can just as easily get stuck there and stay there. And our faith stays very, very small if we're not very careful. But Elijah and Elisha don't do that, do they? They cross over. They go into a new horizon. They go into what's not new territory to them, but the metaphor doesn't fall apart. They cross over the Jordan River. There's something very notable, I think, as well, too, especially in the attitude and the actions of Elisha. Again, what does Elijah say to him a number of times throughout this entire scene? What does he say? 
hey, just, I want you to stay here, Elisha. The Lord has told me to go to Bethel, but Elisha is not content with that, is he? As he say over and over again, three times he says, as surely as the Lord lives, I will never leave you. I was reading through this story, and again, I think a lot of times in movies, and it reminded me of, of, of the Marvel movies. The moment you remember, I don't know if you remember this, if you've seen it, the first Captain America movie, Bucky and, and Steve Rogers are there, and Steve has just lost his mom. And Bucky utters a line that's very important for the rest of the whole Captain Marvel uh, saga, he says this, Bucky looks at Steve and he says, what Steve says, you know what, here's the deal, man. He goes, I can handle this on my own. I don't need anybody. I'm in a bad place right now. And Bucky says, I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. And that's very important because later on when they find themselves on opposite sides of the battle lines, and Bucky has now become Winter Soldier and, Cap and Steve Rogers has become Captain America. Steve Rogers, Captain America, looks at Bucky to try to get some sense back into him. And what does he utter? What's the line he utters? I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. And it shocks him back into reality. He, held, he holds on to that line all this time. That's what I think of when I think of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah says, you know, stay here. I'm going by myself. Elijah always seemed like the guy who was like, I just want to be by myself. I don't want anybody else around me. I'm going to do my ministry isolated and solitary. And Elisha says, I'm not content with that. I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. I'm not going anywhere. Most believe the point of Elisha's not leaving Elijah's side is to test whether Elisha will count the cost of discipleship to see if he will persist, to see if he'll keep going on. Even all this time when they go to the school of prophets and the school of prophets say, hey, did you know like your master is going to be taken away from you today? You know, sometimes in life when you get those voices that just kind of start to harp at you, like, what are you going to do when this is gone? What are, you, what are you going to do when this is not true? And I don't think that the school of prophets had ill intent, but I think we very much have deterrence and distractions in life where we hear voices that say, what are you going to do now when things aren't the same? What are you going to do when things completely go sideways? Are you going to still be faithful? Elijah or Elisha desires Elijah's spiritual strength and his power. And he knows that he's about to assume a leadership role. Elisha sees in Elijah the faithfulness and the power that he desired, and he wanted the same in his life. Well, we shouldn't be surprised, should we? Because this has defined Elisha from the very beginning. This had always been ingrained in Elisha from the moment God called him, and Elijah passed the baton. See, this isn't the official baton passing here. It had actually happened back in 1 Kings 19. If you want to go with me and just go back a few pages to 1 Kings 19. Very, very interesting story here in the call of Elisha. It says in 1 Kings 19, I'm going to actually start reading in verses 15 and 16, how did this all start? The Lord told Elijah, go back the same way that you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And then who shows up? Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. And we go to verse 19, it says, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left, I love that moment. That's like a drop the mic moment, by the way. It's like, wow. can you imagine how weird that would be? Like you're out working one day, you're doing whatever, and wow, a cloak over you, and the guy just walks away. Like, what? He knows exactly what that means. That meant something back in that day to them. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So El Elisha didn't have to do much, too much thinking because what happens in verse 21? Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Guys, the truth is that I believe with every fiber of my being that God has a plan and a purpose for each 
one of our lives. A plan that is undoubtedly greater than any of us could believe or imagine. But guys, to get to a greater life, listen to this. This is the inconvenient truth. To get to a greater life, it's going to cost you everything in the process. Imagine that. It's like Jesus was here today and he stepped up here and he's like, I'm going to talk to each one of you. And he's like, I'm going to tell you what I have for you. And you're like, ooh, oh yes, 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 I like that, I like that. And he says, guess what though? You're going to have to give everything else up. Ooh. It happened constantly in Jesus' ministry, didn't it? Rich young ruler. I've got all these things. He said, well, go and sell them and then give them to the poor and then you can come and follow me. And it says the young man goes away with a very sad face for he had many, many possessions that ruled his heart. Jesus says as well in in the Gospels, doesn't he? And he says a line like, you need to deny yourselves and you need to take up your cross and you need to follow after me. If you want a greater life and you want to live a kingdom life, it's going to require potentially giving up everything. It shows up here in the story of Elisha. Guys, that's, that's why many people will never live a life more than they have now, because they're not willing to give up everything for the greater something that God has for them. Guys, to gain something greater, to gain the kingdom of God, requires us to give up anything and even sometimes everything. And we do that by operating with a big, bold faith. I want you to consider the situation here in 1 Kings 19, because I think it's a foundation for what happens in 2 Kings 2. I mean, Elisha is very well-to-do. He's very rich. Now, you probably wouldn't get that when you think about that, but he is the son of Shaphat, who seems to have a pretty big farm operation going on. I mean, he's out there in the field. Shaphat evidently has plenty of possessions because he has, it says here in in the scriptures, 12 teams of oxen. That's 24 oxen. That's a big deal for somebody back in that day. He seemingly has an impressive workforce. Elisha, it says, is with the 12th team of oxen, leading us to ask who's behind the other ones. It leads us to speculate that there are many workers, a sizable workforce, who are leading the other teams. And for this large of an operation, you're going to have to have a sizable chunk of land, right? It's very, very interesting. It tells us that Elisha is from a land called Abel Mehola. And do you know what Abel Mehola means? The dancing meadow. It sounds so magical, right? I mean, there were probably fairies and rainbows and gold dust flittering around in this land that Elisha was from. I'm kidding, guys, but only kind of, right? Elisha stands to inherit all of this. He is working for this gigantic operation. He has absolutely no reason to leave this life unless there was something greater waiting for him. And you know what? I think that Elisha, I don't think, it. I I believe this. Elisha is just a young guy. I don't know if he's a teenager. I don't know if he's in his early 20s. He's, he's seemingly an adventurous guy. If you follow the rest of his story throughout Scripture, he has no problem with being very frank and very forward, very full of faith. But here's what youth sometimes does. Youth oftentimes breeds restlessness. Oh, that's not good enough for me. I've got to go on to something else. That can be good. That can be bad. For Elisha, it ended up being very, very good. And all that he had in his life in the dancing meadow didn't seem like it was really fulfilling Elisha. I mean, why would you leave that? You're set to inherit a fortune. And he says, eh, there's something greater and better for me. Guys, I believe, it doesn't say it here, it's just speculation on my part, but I believe that there was something empty in Elisha. He knew that there had to be more, as it's famously been said in a song, he still hadn't found what he was looking for. Searching and searching in his restlessness. Guys, Elisha is, for all intents and purposes, being called from a life of lifestyles of the rich and famous to a life of being on the run, having little, and there being danger around every turn. I don't know about you, but if you were offered that, that, given that offer in life, which one would you choose? Probably all of us know in a heart of hearts, we're like, ah, I'm going to And the way that he steps into this life, the way Elisha steps into this life, is nothing short of shocking. Again, verse 21. 
He burns the plows and he slaughters the animals. Guys, it would have been easy enough for Elisha to sacrifice an oxen, let alone, I don't know if it means here that he just slaughtered the two oxen that he had on his team, or they slaughtered all 24 oxen that were a part of this operation. That's a pretty significant sacrifice, though. One oxen alone would have fed a family of five for a year plus. Like, that's, he could have said, that's, I mean, that's pretty good, God, right? Like, I'm giving up something that would feed a family for a year plus. So what does it say and how great is the sacrifice when it says Elisha doesn't probably just kill one oxen, he kills multiple oxen. It is very clear at this moment that Elisha is communicating my life. There is no turning back. There is no plan B to this situation here. Guys, Elisha was the CEO of Shafat Farms Incorporated. He was set to inherit that. He was set to be the big cheese, land, oxen, manpower, and now he is a nobody. You know what it says there at the very end? What does it say? He went with Elijah as his what? Assistant. He is just an unpaid intern with Elijah. He's doing grunt work. He's a gopher in this entire situation, but he submits his resignation letter in this moment, and as one person has stated, he cooked his old way of life, and he ate it for dinner. Guys, that is pretty, pretty graphic and pretty big and bold. You want to know that I'm done with my old life? Yep, I'm cooking it for dinner and I'm eating it. That's it. What would lead to such a radical act in Elisha's life? One thing I believe. Boldness. A very bold faith. A big audacious, greater things are in store faith. Guys, boldness doesn't mean I do what I want and I don't care what anybody else thinks. That's not boldness. That's selfishness and pig-headedness. I mean a bold faith as in not hesitating, being courageous, being very daring in your faith. There is no plan B. It's straight ahead. There's no looking back. I was watching, of all things, an episode of Shark Tank this week. You know how I like my Shark Tank. I go on little like cycles where I'm like, ah, I'm kind of tired of this show. and like, ah, I got to go back to this show. I'm glad that I did because I found a wonderful illustration for my sermon. Of all places, Shark Tank and from Mr. Mark Cuban himself. There was a woman standing up there, and she was pitching her business, and it was very clear, and they asked her, what is your end goal for this entire business? And she said very boldly and frankly, to sell it, which naturally to us, you're like, well, no, duh. Wouldn't you want to sell your business and make millions? And Mark Cuban said this, and this really struck me. I think, guys, this is the kind of faith that God often calls us to. Mark Cuban says this. He has, he has some rules for investing in entrepreneurs and startup businesses. And his first rule is this, that the person who is leading it has to have an undying passion for what they're doing. And he says, you know what rule two is? Rule two is if you have an exit strategy, then you don't have an undying passion for it. I was like, wow. Like, I feel like, I don't feel like I know that's what God is saying to us. Do, do you love me? Or like you say that you love me, but it seems to me like you have plan B, C, D, E, all the way to Z over here. You know what that means? You don't have an undying passion for following me. It is plan A, nothing else. Burn the ships. Burn the plows. I am not coming back to this. Which takes us back to 2 Kings chapter 2. What in the world, in this moment, as Elijah says, I want you to stay here, and Elisha says, nope, I'm not going to do it. What would cause Elisha to disregard the man that he dedicated his life to, that was his mentor, his spiritual father? He had given up everything in his life to follow after the model, pattern, example, and life of Elijah. What would cause him to do that? It's actually quite a simple answer, but a very profound reason that he does this. It's because he wasn't chasing after Elijah, you see. He was chasing after God. It wasn't Elijah that Elisha was after. It was God that Elisha was after. The power of God. The spirit of God. Now he wanted to stay close to Elijah, but that was only because he wanted to get nearer to God. Guys, a very, very important point there. I don't want you to miss that here. 
Chase after God if you want to see and stay in the power of God. It's really as elementary and simple as that, but it's very hard to act out in life, isn't it? It's hard to follow that in life. Guys, Elisha will not be deterred from following his master, his spiritual father, but in a greater way to follow in God's call for his life. You see what this is, right? Elijah is, in the Bible, a type of Christ. Elisha is who we are called to be, to go anywhere in our faith and devotion in Christ. And again, you notice how the prophets keep kind of saying to Elisha, you know, you know, you know Elijah's going to be gone here pretty soon, right? Like, what are you going to do? Will you live the same? Will you have the same kind of devotion? What in the world causes Elisha to just keep on going? Guys, bold, audacious faith starts with following God wholeheartedly. You remember the way that it's said in Deuteronomy, and Jesus repeats it later in the gospel. He says that you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of what? Your strength. Everything. If you want bold, audacious faith to step out and do what God is calling to you, you need to follow God wholeheartedly in your life. Guys, bold, audacious faith as well, too, is nearly always linked to a big ask. The big ask here in 2 Kings 2 is what? Elijah says, Elisha, ask me, what do you want from me? And he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Again, not to be greater than you, not to be more wonderful than you, not to do more amazing things than you but to take on your leadership, to take on your ministry, to do greater things for God. Not for me, not for my name, but for God's name. When invited to make a request, Elisha asked for a very, very big thing, a double portion. He could have asked for anything, but he asked for this, more of God's spirit. Elisha didn't seek wealth. He didn't seek position. He didn't seek power. He didn't seek to share in the advantages on which he had turned his back forever. Oh God, if you maybe could give my dad back those oxen that we slaughtered, that would be really, no. I want your spirit, God. I mean, I want you to think for a moment what it was like for Elisha in that moment to pick up the leadership mantle of Elijah. Again, the, the, the leadership baton didn't just fall from heaven and smack Elisha in the head. And he goes, well, I guess. conscious decision in faith to step out and say, I'm going to live this life. But he had to decide, do I really want to take this on? Elijah's ministry was one of great power, but it was one of also of great danger too. And then as Elisha crosses back over the Jordan in this story, after Elijah's exit, it seems that he is in many ways saying this, as he had said before in 1 Kings 19, I am fully leaving behind this old life and I'm setting my spirits on new and greater things. What do you have for me, God? Guys, when you are operating in God's call for your life, you'll have moments when you need just a little bit more faith than normal. This is one of those moments in scripture for Elisha. And if if 1 Kings 19 is the initial call when the baton really gets passed, 2 Kings 2 I describe as being the signing of that contract. Are you really sure you want to do this? Because you're about to put your name down right here and you're going to live this the rest of your life. It's called counting the cost. Are you going to do this? Guys, what does, what does any and all of this mean for, for us, for you, for me? Because I believe that God isn't just calling Elijah's and Elisha's, Peter's and Paul's, Billy Graham's and ever, other many modern day heavy hitters. He's also calling us. He wants the same thing for us. Now, are we going to go out and make axe heads float in, in the water? Are we going to like bring people back from the dead? No, but that's what, what it was about. It was about the foundation of faith that these guys had in their life. Guys, God is absolutely calling us to a bold faith. And for Elisha, he's never content to do things halfway or to have a plan B, C, or D. It was all or nothing for Elisha. Guys, 90% of the time, 
Failure results because plan A gets too risky for us or too costly or too difficult. It's not that it won't or it doesn't have a chance to succeed, but it's because we short circuit it when we get fearful of the unknown in our lives. Guys, this is when faith has to kick into a higher gear, when we need to have a big, hairy, audacious faith, to be willing to crash and burn for God, then succeed in the wrong things because it means nothing in the end. Guys, if you're going to follow after Jesus with a big, bold faith, nothing can be off limits to God in your life. Nothing. You can't just go to God and be like, I give you everything. And God says, what's that thing right there? Well, not, not that thing, but like all that right there. Well, that's not everything. That's something, but it's not everything because you're holding back that thing. What is that thing for you that you're holding back? That if you want to follow after Jesus and you have to take up your cross, you have to let it go. Guys, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme or a clever PR stunt. It's real life, and living it requires a big, bold, God-sized faith like you can't even imagine. There's a story that's told of a little girl. There was a missionary at the church that morning, and he was speaking, and he gave this invitation moment uh, towards the end of his talk, and this little girl gets up from her seat, and she walks up to the table, and he was he was asking, you know, if you want to just put your yes on the table. So she walked up there and she put her yes on the table and her dad was just kind of looking the whole time. He's like, like does the girl want to be a missionary? What's going on? Like, she sits down and he looks at her and he says, honey, he says, what? what's going on here? Like, what, like you're, you do want to be a missionary? She goes, no, I don't want to be a missionary. And he goes, well, why'd you walk up to the table? She said, daddy, all I wanted to do is I wanted to walk up there. I want to put my yes on the table so that when God asks me, I've already given the answer. Guys, that's, that's the question, I think, for all of us today. God is, is wanting you and wanting every one of us, he's wanting me to, to come forward in our lives, to step out in big and bold faith and just put our yes on the table. And be like, well, wait, wait a minute, right? What, I need to know what, what God is calling me. No, you don't. We don't get that luxury of always knowing what God is calling us to. But I guarantee you this, it's greater it's better than anything you've got in your life. It's better than any plan you've worked up in your life. Unfortunately, we live in a day and an age where we have this tendency to say, I'm going to do all that God wants me to do, except for if it doesn't work out, then I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Like we have contingency plans, and the problem, guys, with contingency plans is it's not what God wants us to be planning. The problem is that contingency plans often offer the path of least resistance. And guys, following God is not the path of least resistance, not the easiest thing in the world. If it's true, guys, that we want to walk in the footsteps of people like, and that we do walk in the footsteps of people like Elijah and Elisha, you have to be ready when you take a step of faith. You have to give God a blank check with your life whenever, wherever, whatever. God, my yes is on the table. It's right there whenever you ask me. I've already given my answer. I don't know what that is for you, and I'm not saying that you like, need to conjure up something right now here on the spot because we're going to have this really amazing moment where you're like, I'm, I'm doing it. No, I don't know what it is. And it may not be something like a super duper big and glamorous. It may be something just really, really small too. But guys, you know what happens in life when you do enough small things with great faith? It leads to greater things. At least the bigger things for God. I love this scripture in Matthew chapter 7. It's very familiar to us, but I want to read it again. And I want you, in the context of what we talked this morning about Elijah and Elisha especially, I want you to hear this again over. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Keep on asking. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Why? Because everybody who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open for those who have faith in our God. Guys, life, life is a series of tests and shakes 
and pruning and maturing. But we also need to know in life that it's just preparation for very good things are coming for those who believe. And I don't think it's just lip service. I'm not trying to just give lip service to that, but I believe, and every one of us here this morning should believe and have the confidence to say not just that good things are coming, they will ultimately, finally, and fully, but the good things are already here. They have begun. We are living in it. Guys, the truth of all of the Bible is that no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, good, bad, or eh, guys, greater things are coming. As long as we are staying close to Jesus, One question as we end here this morning, I really want you to think about this. I want you to take this with you this morning. Is there something more that God's calling you to? And, and you know it, and you've known it for a really long time, and you're like, darn it, Ryan, I came here this morning, you had to do, I, I didn't have to do something greater in store that he's trying to show you in your life. If so, what in the world is holding you back? Very simple, but very powerful things. Stay close to the model of your faith what Elisha did with Elijah. You need to draw closer and run after the source of your faith. Guess what, guys? No. Is the one that does that. do this. No. It's got to be in his will. It's got to be in his name. It's got to be for his glory and his kingdom. But guys, do not be afraid. Never, ever be afraid to say, I'm going to make a really big ask right now, God. God's going to say, that's fine, because I'm a pretty big God. And what we also need to do, guys, is we need to step out with a close this up here and band's going to get ready to come back up here and lead us in a final song. Here's the interesting thing about Elisha. I didn't say in the story, but if we read into it, we understand. This wasn't just a cute, quick little trip for Elisha. Like, man, wasn't that awesome? I was with Elijah and I saw this. Do you know what we don't see in this story? We don't see Elijah do any miracles. There's no evidence that Elisha ever got to see any of the miracles of Elijah. And he was just his understudy. He was his grunt. He was his assistant walking around, probably by the best guess of people, for about 18 years of his life. But you know what he did see in 18 years of his life? A man who was full of faith. And that, at the end of his life, was what led him to say, I don't, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. I want to get all of the faith that's in Elijah. But we shouldn't be surprised, right, guys? Because that's the story of the Bible that we think. You know, sometimes, guys, guess what? Life requires us to wait and to be patient. We, th we think about David, right? Oh, David, he was like the king of Israel. What in the world did he have to wait for in his life? He was crowned king, and then you know what happened to him? Where he went? Back out with a sheep for like another five or six years. He was the king of all of Israel. He's like, I'm just going to go back here with the sheep. Wait. We talked last month, didn't we, about Joseph. Joseph, you're going to be so great that people are going to bow down to you. Oh, yeah, when does that happen? 14 years later, and a whole series of misfortunes, it happens. It happens in the life of Jesus, doesn't it? He has been given all things and all authority. It's been handed to him. And what does Jesus do? He lays it down. 
because I'm not going to tap into that. I'm going to live my life by the power of the Father. Whatever the Father tells me to do, whatever he tells me to say, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to live. Jesus is at the right hand of God today, but he has not fully realized his reign in his kingdom. Sometimes. You have to wait. Why do you think you wait in your life? Because all of the Bible is about waiting for the good things to come, but they are coming. Guys, we have to believe greater things are in store. Would you pray with me?